How are you all today? Good to be here with you. My name is Naomi Seyung Woodstruck, and I am currently serving as your Central District Field Outreach Minister with the Iowa Conference of the United Methodist Church, which means I resource the pastors and the laity of 83 churches in six county area in the central region of the state and about 15 extension ministers who serve as chaplains in hospitals or at college campuses or with hospice ministries. So I am just excited and glad to be here. Um, was just have enjoyed the time yesterday and this morning with the folks at Hopkins Grove and JRL group last night. Please join me in prayer before I begin. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For those of you who are poets or readers of poetry, I want to begin our time together with an excerpt from T.S. Eliot's Choruses from the Rock. Endless invention, Endless experiment brings knowledge of motion, but not of stillness. Knowledge of speech, but not of silence. Knowledge of words and ignorance of the word. Where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Though written far before our time, T.S. Eliot's words ring true today in a profound way. I'm not sure about all of you, um, but my typical day is usually spent entrenched and wondering how I'm going to get through the multiple to-dos on my work list of items, let alone my personal list of to-dos, spending time with family, loved ones, and friends, and also finding time to eat, um, sleep, and renew. In the midst of these multiple demands um, and the deafening noise from the chaos in our culture, communities, and world, and in our daily lives, we are often felt wondering um, if we've disappointed ourselves at the end of the day, if we made enough time for our families, and if we fail to meet the expectations God has set out for us. As Don Postman notes in his book, Space for God, Study and Practice in Spirituality and Prayer, to live so deeply is a special challenge, for it is so easy to be superficial. We are so busy. We have so many urgent things to do, so many people to meet, so many books to read, so many events to attend. Either our jobs demand time and overtime, or we are unemployed and looking and spending time either looking for work or worrying about not finding it. Problems in many of parts of the world concern us, but we often feel at a loss about not being able to do anything. We simply don't have the time. Our calendars are filled with appointments, Doctors, dentists, music lessons, potlucks, concerts, sporting events, meetings. Someday, after driving the children around, or mowing the lawn, or putting in some overtime, or coming back from the ball game, you might fall exhausted into your chair. And maybe, instead of falling asleep, your mind will look over the day with its knocks and opportunities. You may even find some questions lingering around the edges. What am I doing in the midst of all this activity and noise? Where am I going? Or maybe that age-old irritator, who am I? As we look at the scriptural text today from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 18, we find the prophet Elijah, who in the previous section has been on the run from Queen Jezebel, who's threatened his life after he killed her prophets. She has promised um, to kill him, and he has run um, from Jezreel to Beersheba, which is almost over 100 miles in the desert on foot. Now, while running, um, Elijah is caught in the midst of finding himself stressed out. He's finding himself um, going through a bit of an existential crisis, alone, trying to find out if God still has purpose for his work and his ministry. Not only does he feel overwhelmed to the extent that he wishes that God would have struck him dead, he's wrestling with the, the doubt again of what he is called to be and do in the world and feels very lost. In the midst of his fleeing, Elijah finds a desolate cave where he hears the voice of God asking him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah responds defending his work and articulating his experience of feeling afraid and alone. Rather than immediate reassurance, Elijah is told by God's messenger to go out of the mountain and wait for God to pass by. Now, the mountain that Elijah is on is just not just any mountain. It's Mount Sinai, 
where in Horeb, which is the same place where Moses communed with God in Exodus chapter 19, verse 16 through 19, and Exodus chapter 20, verse 18 through 21. What Elijah encounters is a unique inverse form of theophany, or the experience of God, from what his predecessor Moses experienced on that same mountain. The passage in verse 11 says, Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks and pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. Rather than the strength brought on by the mightiness of strong wind, shaking earthquake, or deafening sounds of fire, it was the sheer silence where Elijah experienced God's presence. Different interpretations utilize different terms for that. Sheer silence, it could be the small voice, the low whisper, shattering silence, stillness. But in the midst of this sheer silence, Elijah felt such fear that he hid his face, afraid to encounter God, the God that moves beyond shape or form. So being at Sinai, the site of God's revelation to Israel, Elijah experiences a profound silence as the Israelites did in Moses' time. Interestingly, in both scriptural passages, God's theophany was intended to craft the community of believers in the covenant. For Elijah, his prophetic ministry was deeply connected to calling the pe people back to the original covenant. In his moments on the mountain and in the sound of silence with God, revealing God's self to him, there was a moment of effort on God's part in this theophany, the way that God presented God's self to Elijah, to renew Elijah in his ministry, to remind him that he was not alone and um, that his ministry, this renewal, this moment of sheer silence was to be taken back to his community of believers. Now, in the midst of his despair, God reminded Elijah that God was with him in the midst of doubt, fear, and anxiety. As theologian, actually, we'll wait on the slides. As theologian Stephanie Y. Mitchum notes, prayer is the base of theological reflection, a conversation between finite human beings and an infinite God. Prayer's dialogical nature becomes clear in God's answer to Elijah. Instead of chastisement, God presented a plan of action to assuage Eliza's deepest fears of Israel's abandonment of the covenant and their desire to kill all prophets. Per his deepest answer might be that we are not alone, whatever the circumstances. We are not so unlike Elijah, struggling to find our way in a life, a culture, and a world that can be overwhelming and can be deafening with its demands and overwhelming interests pulling us in multiple directions. Theologian Wendell W. Myers notes, Elijah's experience calls us to be sensitive to the power of our confining projections, our well-entrenched notions of how God's presence is made meaningful in the convoluted patterns of our everyday lives. Do we fail to see God's hand at work in our lives because we believe that God's presence is always made manifest in wind, earthquake, and fire? He goes on to note, it's heartening and inspiring to see that this favored one of God was so human in his character and career, susceptible to dejection, fear, self-doubt, and insecurity. Elijah's hum humanity assures us that God is indeed faithful, even in the face of our fear and depression, our worries and weariness, our blindness to God's revelations, and our resistance to growth and change. Much like in Elijah, we are invited to seek ways to create prayerful times of silence that set us apart um, from the cacophony of our lives and help us to find peace within ourselves, with all of humanity and with God, so we can reemerge from that metaphoric cave, renewed to live lives full of wholeness and peace. Now, finding time to allow that space for sheer silence of God's presence to guide us and nurture us and find space within ourselves to understand all that is going on and to share that with our loved ones, our community, and the world is almost countercultural at this point in our culture's existence. So much of the external chaos in our lives and in our world is exasperating, and it can take a destructive bent. Um, when we're not able to look within ourselves and also see the way that God is present with us in those silent moments.
in his book, Living Buddha, Living Christ, Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a renowned Buddhist leader and a peace activist internationally, noted, I have been engaged in peace work for more than 30 years, combating poverty, ignorance, and disease, going to sea to help rescue boat people, evacuating the wounded from combat zones, resettling refugees, helping hungry children and orphans, opposing wars, producing and disseminating peace literature, training peace and social workers, and building the practice of meditation. It is through this that I'm able to stop, calm myself, and look deeply, that I've been able to nourish and protect the sources of my spiritual energy and continue this work. For the past few weeks, I've had the opportunity to participate in some Peace Circle trainings. How many of you are familiar with Peace Circles or have heard of them? No one? Okay, so peace circles have been around for centuries. Um, they are a process that was used originally by native communities um, to encourage the development of deep conversation, deep relationship, and to address um, situations that may be tumultuous in a community. With this peace circles process, which are commonly right now used in public school systems, they're used with criminal justice systems, and we're just beginning to engage with them more deeply in faith community work. Um, the process is entered where everyone comes together and you sit with a circle where it's open. There's not tables in front of you blocking you. You're just sitting there in a chair in a circle together facing one another. And in the center of that circle, there is usually a centerpiece um, which basically combines something meaningful that's shaping the conversation of the space where people come together. And I'll get into it a little bit longer, but people put their values, their core values into that circle on a, a sheet of paper or on something visually to show so that while people are talking together, um, they uplift the core values that are shared by everyone in that group. Now there's a talking piece, and that's what's a little bit different with the peace circle process. There's a talking piece that is shared throughout the entire group. So whoever is holding the talking piece is the person who shares. And when people share, I'm talking about sharing your authentic self, sharing your truth, sharing your stories in a way that's non -jud not judged, in a way that's safe, and in a way that's transformative. And so whoever is holding the talking piece is able to speak for as long as they want. And that is um, very different than how our cultural us culture usually operates with trying to time people, truncate everything, get people to move on to the next thing. So it's a, a space where people are allowed to just share. Um, and for introverts, those of you who may be introverts in the room, it allows space for those of you who have deep thoughts but are never given the opportunity to share them because someone else jumps in, to just be able to have that space to equally share. So one of the trainings, um, one of the trainers, we're beginning this process with the Central District churches and with the whole um, annual conference, which is over 800 churches in the state. Um, the intent is that we are actually just in the Central District training all of our clergy um, during the charge conferences and also all of the laity in our district and how to enter into peace circles to understand processes of discipleship. Um, building deep relationships and to strengthen small groups. Now I know from some of your staff and from the pastors that you have really strong groups here at JROL and Hopkins Grove and at New Hope, which is amazing. So this may be incorporated into all of it. Um, all of your clergy and some of your lay leaders, including Jessica, not sure where she went, have been trained in this. Um, so it's just something that's, again, transformative to experience it as something different to listen to it. But one of the trainings that I went through um, was a three-day training, actually, with a national facilitator, Kay Pranis, who lives in the Twin Cities. And it was with a group of 30 people from Des Moines who are educators, faith leaders, um, nonprofit leaders, and some folks from governmental entities and criminal justice systems. And so we spent three days living into this process. And I'm just going to share this quote because it really uplifts um, from Kay Pranis, who was the trainer, um, how people really experience this opportunity. Peacemaking circles bring together the ancient wisdom of community and contemporary value of respect for the individual in a process which honors the presence and dignity of every participant, values their contributions, emphasizes the connectedness of all things, supports emotional and spiritual expression and gives equal voice to all. Now, 
I'm going to also move to the next slide, actually. So this, this process, um, we have a couple of clergy who are retired right now and some laity who are working with Circle's process with the Mitchellville Women's Prison. And so they um, have spent an intentional amount of time allowing space for these women to share their stories, um, to share some of their pain, but also some of their joys and their hopes for their lives. So this process, it's just truly transformative um, in our culture to be able to be fully heard and listened to and to be able to share your truth. So there there are seven core assumptions for peace circles. And I'm going to read these here. I'm sorry, it's a little hard to see up there. Um, but these are things that are intrinsic to us as Christian community. The first one is the true self in everyone is good, wise, and powerful. The second is the world is profoundly interconnected. The third is all human beings have a deep desire to be in good relationships. Number four is all human beings have gifts and everyone is needed for what they bring. Number five is everything we need is make, to make positive changes is already here. Number six is that human beings are holistic. And number seven is that we need practices to build habits of living from the core self. And we're going to go on to the next section. So in, in the Peace Circles process, people are invited, again, to share the, the majority of the first session of a peace circle is just getting to know the people in the circle. The second part of the peace circle process is for people to go around and each person to share one or two core values that they value in life, that they value in their faith, um, that they, they live into. And so common circle values, um, again, each person in the circle goes around and shares them, can be love, respect, inclusivity, generosity, courage, trust, sharing, empathy, humility, and honesty. These are pretty, pretty core um, concepts. Let's go to the next slide, actually. So the, the circles process, again, it sounds probably a little bit um, amorphous <laughs> to not experience it fully, but it's a core part of balancing all the parts of who we are as human people. And so it looks at the emotional parts of who we are, feelings and how they're experienced, sharing from the heart. It looks at mental thoughts, um, spirit, self-reflection, the way that we analyze and synthesize information, recognizing interests, needs, and difference, um, the physical parts of ourselves, um, taking care of our physical needs, personal, and for the full group when you're in a circle, you're, you're mindful of if people have different abilities or need um, different ways of experiencing the circle, and body language. Again, body language is something that we give off, intentionally or not, that shows how we are either in, um, welcoming someone's story or maybe um, avoidant with that. Spiritual values, values that direct behavior, connecting with what matters. So these are core parts of who we are, and they're incorporated, again, into that core system. So it, it provides a space, um, just in those three days, that group of 30 adults, um, it felt like we were transformed. I met, was able to meet with Kay Pranas after the training, and I told her I felt like I'd been on a spiritual retreat just for this three-day period um, because it was so renewing and it's so transformative to experience a space where we can shed some of our artificialities and, again, really genuinely uplift and hold sacred each person and their unique experience. For those of you who work with um, different areas in Des Moines or the Johnston area or the Des Moines metro area, um, a lot of school systems in the Des Moines metro area are actually incorporating this. Um, Fred Van Lu, who's the trainer um, with criminal justice systems in Iowa and in um, Maine is working with this, um, with situations where there's victim offender situations, um, bullying issues in schools, um, a lot of different areas. And it's been powerful to watch. Both he and Kay also travel to different schools around the country. They've worked in um, some of the areas of New York City. They've worked in different areas um, just to begin to say, what would it look like if we transformed our world through allowing people to find spaces for stillness, for peace? and for being their authentic selves. So as we return and connect this in with the, the bigger narrative that we are talking about today, I just wanna share this quote with you. It's from Rachel Naomi Raymond. It says, the most basic and powerful way to connect to another person is to listen, just to listen. Perhaps the most important thing we ever give each other is our attention. A loving silence often has more power to heal and to connect than the most well-intentioned words. 
So Elijah's encounter, going back to the biblical narrative with God in that sheer silence, was so powerful because it was an opportunity for God to renew Elijah, to remind him of his core value and worth as a prophet, um, to provide space to speak that broke apart um, some of the expectations that Elijah had for how God would be present in his life. And most importantly, the connection with the circles process is that that renewal for Elijah through that time and that space of silence with God was meant to be taken back to his community um, so that they could also live into a different way of being. So when we take time apart from our frenzied schedules and overbooked lives to just breathe, to listen to God in the quiet stillness, to be fully present, to deeply listen to the stories of those around us, their joys, their sorrows and hopes, and to intentionally pray with them, we contribute to a greater movement of healing in ourselves and in the world um, by beginning in that still quiet space with God within us. So this coming week, I encourage you to seek those moments of stillness, to listen for God's movement in your life, in the life of your family or your loved ones, and the world in the midst of the chaos that's going on, and to challenge yourself to take a few extra minutes of your own time to really deeply be present with the people around you, to hear and value their stories, and to not be distracted by so much of the chaos around us. In